Well, hello everyone. Thank you for having us. Uh, we are both here on behalf of Framestore. My name is Juan Hernandez, and this is my colleague Stefan Meyer. Um, we are both visual development artists in, in Framestore London, and we are excited to be here to show you how a company, a massive studio like Framestore, uses uh, Blender to bring characters to life. Um, some of you may know Framestore. Some of you may not know it, but I'm pretty confident you know our work. So I would like to show you this reel highlighting uh, the kind of stuff that we do. No playing. Hello, everyone. So, Framestore's visual development or VistaF department. What is it? Um, we are a pretty small team, so we are like five people, and we are the CG guys. And we work really close with supervisors and clients in order to help the client realize his vision. So, um, I'm lost now. <laughs> Uh, so basically, working so close to a client and really working with them together, we try to build a lot of confidence and trust um, in order to find a look and feel of the character he wants to create um, as perfect as possible to tell, to tell the story. Um, we use Blender, but why do we use Blender? Or the question is, why should we not use Blender? Uh, most and foremost, Blender is extremely versatile. So we have the entire package in one software where we can work from the beginning to the end. Um, sometimes, though, Blender is... Uh, when we work in Blender, we stay in the same world. However, sometimes we want to communicate or work together with other departments um, within Framestore, especially the animation department, and they don't work with Blender. So the entire flow gets a bit interrupted. And in order to do so, we have some little additions uh, in Blender to bridge these gaps and to unify workflows. And one of these bridges is templates. There we go. So first, we would set our shot or our asset we're working on right now. From there on, we import our predefined templates. Um, what there are is really just Blender scenes, which we then use as render passes, and these scenes have predefined collections to them. Each collection in each render pass is set to, hey, am I a holdout or am I indirect only, or maybe it's not visible at all. So this way we unify the workflow a little bit and kind of enforce naming conventions. Things can be renamed or altered, but the default setup gives you like the Framestore structure out of the box. Then we use the compositor 
to bundle up all our renders in the file output node, and which then stores everything into the database corresponding to the shot we set or the asset we're working on. When we're done there, we can launch our batch renderer, and we pick what render paths we want to kick out. Uh, each render path can be given its own samples or even its own render resolution. And then we just add a little comment and submit it to the farm. OK, and there are two major outputs. One is um, the beauty output, which is the final render. Anything light information, like light groups or light passes themselves. And we have the light independent outputs, which is like data. Um, it's position paths, it's depth, or just like custom painted ID maps. These then later on in compositing are usually extremely helpful. And we just try to mimic frame st structure. So later on in compositing, it doesn't matter if you pick a Blender render or a frame st in house render render. It's all the same then, really. Another tool we have um, is called the Palette Nodes. The point for this is when we work with other departments and they don't use Blender, but we need to pick up work from them, we pick them up as an Alembic. And with Alembic, we're losing all shaders, shader assignments, subdivisions, visibility. So this Palette Nodes should bridge the gap. Um, we predefine a node tree which, based on naming rules, reassigns or reimports the shaders and assigns them to the given geometry based on this tree. Have a little walkthrough on this one. So we have uh, toothless. And this is how we would pick up toothless from, let's say, animation department. Um, he's completely stripped of any shaders. He has no subdivision modifier to it applied. Also, visibility, everything is visible, even if it's maybe a tech mesh, which shouldn't be rendered. And from here on then, we can just import the palette, which has been exported, let's say, from a look dev scene. And here now, it brought in all the shaders and automatically assigns the shaders to the object we told it to go to in the palette itself. Apart from shaders, as well as subdivision settings or visibility settings, and we are ready to go. So the bridge is complete, and we can pick something up and render. So even though this was in a very, very early stage of production, um, the client was just absolutely excited to see his baby in so early days being lit, animated, rendered, and in yeah, just no time. Um, which brings me to another object, uh, another project we worked on, which is uh, Imaginary Friends. And this one was, uh, for us, extremely huge and creative. This project has around uh, has a lot of like crazy characters, abstract characters, imaginary characters. And we did around 40 of them. Not all of them made them into a movie, but all of them were actually quite an important part to find a design to tell the story. Um, there we have a character called Blossom. And she's an example of a very straightforward workflow. So we receive a concept from the client, which would be this one here. And we make it in 3D. So this would be our version. Even though it differs a bit to the concept, but it's like 2D versus 3D, as long as we keep the essence, we are all good. And in order to keep the essence even more, we always present it like in a concept pose or give it individual pose to sell the personality of the character as well. On top of this, we always render a turntable just so we can charge it from all different angles, as well as um, how does it react to light overall. OK, while this was a pretty straightforward workflow from 2D concept to 3D, there is situations where it's different. One of them was this dragon. This was the concept. Um, so it was an actual toy, which was also present in the movie. And the brief was, can you please make this dragon as a bipedal character 
and a little bit less scary. So we did it. Um, we put a version together and also straight into the shot where he will later appear in the movie, just for the client to understand better how, how is it going to work. And he was extremely liked. However, there was a new brief then, um, if we can make it more based on this sculpt. <laughs> so this sculpt was actually sent from a director himself. He made it on set. And he said, OK, based on this, out of plasticine, also the dragon is a nurse. OK, um, we did another go, and we gave him this version, which as well was really appreciated and loved it. But then, based on the script, the character changed again, and the new brief then was this year. So <laughs> it's an elephant now. So we have no, no clue what it's supposed to look like. Can it just be creative? Um, we were creative when we did a new version. <laughs> and again, put him into short context. And this was just a character where I think showed extremely well how quickly iterative we could be and versatile as well, like putting things in a realistic plate but make it look like cartoony and give the director options if you have the right tool at your hands. And was for us Blender. However, even though we all liked, we went back to a complete early, early concept, which we again then picked up. We did a version, gave it to the asset team, they finalized it, and then in the, render, in the final movie, this is the final product. Okay, that's it for me. Um, I'm going to give it to Juan and talk about more dragons. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to show you some of the work that we did for the How to Train Your Dragon live action movie that came out this year. Uh, this was fully post-produced in Framestore, so it, the whole movie was done uh, in-house. And I mean, it was a massive amount of work. We got to create lots of like, super cool looking dragons and huge environments. Um, at the vis visual development department, we, we got a key task, and it is how would these dragons look in real life? Because the animated movie already existed. It was about transferring those, those designs and keeping the character but making them look real. This was in 2023, so it was before uh, filming had started. And this is kind of like the key value of our department is trying to help filmmakers, directors, supervisors understand uh, where we're going ahead of time so, so we can prioritize creativity uh, and be confident that what we're making is going to be epic. The frames of our department first started with, with a round of designs. This could be any forms like sketches or sculpts. And this will set the initial path for each individual dragon. This was a great start for us because it meant we, we are starting for something that uh, it was liked by the, by the client. Um, yeah, and it was for us to, to keep improving. Before we do anything, the uh, we do a massive reference gather. It's about finding inspiration from real animals. Um, each dragon is mainly based on, a, on an animal, so Toothless is like a salamander or a panther. The Deathly Nader is like an iguana, the Gronk or a frog, and so on. So this was a great source of inspiration and also like a great point of conversation with, with the filmmakers. Then we moved to a, a dragon creation in Blender. Uh, this is where Blender shows to be an amazing tool. The Blender allows us to build these characters quickly and you know, prioritize creativity. Um, to really understand the value of an image like this, you have to understand that there is a lot of faith in VFX. It takes some time for, for filmmakers to see a final looking image. So yeah, this is where I think we, we, we can contribute uh, and have a lot of influence in the final result. Here are some of the renders we did to present the dragons. We, we did a whole lineup of dragons for the movie. Um, and even though we, we approach this character as concepts, we, we still do a bind post, we do rigs, look development, we research uh, what kind of details we want to add, materiality, and we can explore poses, different lighting scenarios. 
and it's all about research and having creative uh, conversations. And, and this is what the business department is always trying to do. And internally, Blender is what really allows us to do that because, I mean, Blender offers great modeling tools, great rigging tools, s s rendering is super fast. Um, sometimes it's amazing, like, we can have a client sitting next to us. We can literally turn on the render and change the poses. We can do sculpting updates. And, and, and like, for them, it's mind-blowing. It's, like, really pushing the boundaries of, of what you can do uh, on CG. So yeah, very powerful. Um, apart from making models, we also do like some context frames. This image right here is very old. This is from 2022. And even though the look of Toothless you know, progress, even uh, from our department, this, this was a great start to have the conversation about what's going to be the style of the movie, how he feels in a real plate. Uh, we can take our own photography, or we can do completely CG environments uh, to present our work. And it's the same case with this render. Because it was ahead of filmmaking, like let's say with if we already had some plates, so we would work directly in there. In, in here, it wasn't the case. But because Previs was running on parallel, uh, and we have a script, we could explore certain moments in the movie. And this was really helpful for the production to understand how they're going to approach the shoot. Uh, we could understand how big these dragons are, how big they should be, how they look next to actors. And eventually, we also sent the models, and they made like these massive puppets and the, like some robots where they can ride for the flying. And one last thing we also do is paint overs, so we can use our CG, and because we can pose these characters, we can do a 2D pass to explore even more quickly, and this can help the production solve some questions, or we can use this internally to improve the CG and do the whole loop, and then present a, a full turntable. So yeah, I would like to highlight how important Blender is for us. Uh, as Stefan said, we are a very tiny team, and, and Blender allows us to have like three people work on 10 movies a year. And we have a, like, a, a lot of influence on the final result, on how it looks. And, and that, for us, is priceless. So I would like to show you one more video showcasing the kind of work we do in the visual development department, uh, all in Blender. Thank you.